This week we'll be talking about the nervous system and we're kind of continuing this trend of systems in our body that control it. Last week we talked about the endocrine system, which was chemical control of our body in response to internal changes to maintain homeostasis. Today with the nervous system, we'll be talking about electrochemical changes and control of our, our body in response to more external changes to maintain homeostasis. I did want to kind of remind you of some of the stuff that we've talked about in previous weeks that's going to reappear here. So we talked a lot in week three about some really relevant topics. We talked about cell signaling, receptors, and cell connections. That's something that we came back to quite a bit last week. So remember, uh, keep that idea of a signal connecting to a receptor and having a cell response in mind. Keep in mind the structure of the plasma membrane, how there's that phospholipid bilayer. So hydrophilic or water soluble molecules are going to have to pass through channels to pass it. Um, we are gonna be thinking a lot about diffusion and osmosis, particularly of ions and particularly in the form of facilitated diffusion, which I'll remind you what that is in a moment. We'll talk about some general tissue types, um, which we talked about in week three, so specifically nervous tissue. I'll remind you of what we talked about before, and then I'll give you a reminder of the structure and function of nervous tissue today. Um, and again, last week we covered the endocrine system, so I'll also brief you, brief, briefly remind you of differences between the endocrine and nervous systems. So remember back in week three, we looked at the four general types of tissue and you looked at these pretty in depth in lab. Um, so there was the epithelial tissue, different types of connective tissue. And we talked about that again when we talked about blood and bone. Um, there's muscle, which you reviewed um, skeletal, smooth and cardiac muscle in lab. Um, and then there's the nervous tissue. So the nervous tissue is what we're going to be focusing on today. Remember, tissue means that there's at least a couple different cell types. So while there's the kind of the classical neuron structure that a lot of you are probably familiar with and that you can see in the bottom left of this slide, there's actually several types of nervous cells. So we'll kind of review some of those glial or support cells today. So here's that neuron that you're really familiar with. Again, this is a slide that you've already seen. So we see kind of the long extended axon. We see all these wiggly structures that help it form connections with other cells. And we see that classical cell body with a nucleus in the middle of it that's kind of warped and distorted by all these dendrites. Um, not all neurons actually look like this, so we'll look at some examples of neurons that look a little bit different, um, but these are kind of the classical multipolar neurons that we're used to seeing. But remember, not all nervous tissue consists of neurons. So here you can see um, the neurons labeled, but then there's all these other things like microglial cells, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, um, things called Schwann cells. So we'll review those different uh, structures and I will talk about the function of each of them and what system they uh, kind of correlate with uh, inside of the greater um, nervous system. So remember, last week we talked about the endocrine system. We talked about how it is really about chemical signaling within our body. Um, while there's kind of a couple of fast responses that we talked about, generally it's more of a slow response with these really carefully controlled feedback loops to changes in the internal environment. The nervous system involves electrochemical signaling, so both electrical and chemical signaling. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but that has a lot to do with the movement of ions across a membrane. So thinking about concentration gradients and kind of getting quantitative about that, thinking about how we can measure those charges. Um, so this is more of a fast response to changes in our external environment, so external stimuli. There are kind of internal receptors that we do have, um, and there's a lot of automated processes, but often this is in response to the external environment. So remember the endocrine system um, is a lot less specific. Those hormones can have a lot of different functions. They kind of get secreted and you hope they end up in the right spot. Um, the nervous system is very precise with very uh, precise connections between cells and it is very carefully controlled uh, numerically. So we'll kind of get into that in a little bit when we talk about action potentials. <laughs> 
So there's a couple chapters we're covering today. Chapter 35 is about the nervous system. So we're looking at structures and divisions of that nervous system. Um, the exact function kind of varies depending on what we're talking about. Um, and there's different regions of our body that we kind of separate out anatomically and functionally or physiologically. So we'll think about individual cells and types of signals um, and then kind of apply that in the next chapter, chapter 36, about sensory systems, thinking about how all these cells and signals and stimuli and structures come together to actually translate into human sense and perception. So when you're thinking about what to focus on for this first chapter, um, these are basically the bullet points that are above the slides and above this video if you're watching it in Canvas. Um, we're going to cover all the different sections, um, but I just want to give you a reminder of what to focus on so that for that first section, think about the structure and function of these cell types in terms of how neurons communicate. Action potentials are really tricky, and so I linked a few videos from Crash Course, which I think are very uh, helpful at kind of describing what action potentials are as a process. Um, it's kind of hard to do that even if I use GIFs in this video. Um, I think having something that's animated um, will be really useful for you to kind of understand that process. So I definitely recommend watching at least the second Crash Course video that's posted in this week's module under Study Resources. Um, but we'll talk about what an action potential is, we'll talk about how voltage-gated channels come into play here, um, talk about different types of facilitated diffusion, We'll define these terms depolarization, repolarization, and hyperpolarization. We'll introduce something called saltatory conduction and the refractory period, and think about how all these signals are sent across the synapse. So especially here, there's a lot of key terms um, where it, it, I don't expect you to know them going into this by any means. You might have seen them in high school, uh, but it might be worth like writing those down right now, like pausing this video, writing those down so you know, hey, these are key terms. I need to know what they mean. I need to know how to apply them. Um, I'll kind of keep them separate in my head and know the definitions of these. So then for the central nervous system, we'll think about what actually makes up the central nervous system. Um, you might have heard about the meninges. Uh, so you might have heard about meningitis, which is swelling of those meninges, and CSF, which is cerebrospinal fluid. I'll define those and kind of show you some pictures of how those tie together uh, different parts of the central nervous system. Um, then we'll talk about the peripheral nervous system, so comparing and contrasting what's called the parasympathetic response, which is breast and digest, and the sympathetic, which is fight or flight. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the nerves that are involved with sending those signals, and then briefly talk about some nervous system disorders. So you should know examples of neurodegenerative, sorry, neurodegenerative disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders, and be familiar with what we mean by epilepsy and stroke. Okay, so this is kind of a helpful flowchart to distinguish uh, different kind of anatomical, kind of functional uh, distinctions or categories or divisions of the nervous system. So generally, the simplest way to divide up the nervous system is the central nervous system, or CNS, and the peripheral nervous system, or PNS. The central nervous system consists of your brain and your spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is basically everything else. Um, so the peripheral nervous system involves sensory neurons uh, that help us kind of perceive the world around us by sending signals from the kind of farther reaches of our body, those sensory organs, to back to our brain. The motor neurons send signals from our brain to our skeletal muscles and glandular tissue um, and uh, smooth muscle as well. So it's a reaction to those sensations um, if they are integrated and perceived in our brain correctly. So we'll kind of talk about what actually needs to happen for that to occur. But then getting into mo kind of the motor neurons, we have distinctions with somatic, which are voluntary movements, and autonomic, which are involuntary. So that's kind of sym the sympathetic that we talked about, fight or flight, and parasympathetic, or rest and digest. So in thinking about kind of divisions of the central nervous system, um, we have these bones that we've talked about when we talked about uh, the skeletal system in lecture. 
We're going to talk about the skeletal system in lab next week, so this will come up again. But within the brain case or the cranium, that's where our brain is stored. And then we have this spine, um, spinal column, the vertebral column running down our back. There's openings in that that protects the spinal cord. So we see that these bones of the axial skeleton, remember we talked about axial and appendicular, axial is that central skeleton, these protect the central nervous system. And the peripheral nervous system does kind of extend into these bones to kind of form connections, um, but these bones in particular are useful for protecting that central nervous system. So when, again, when we're thinking about divisions of the nervous system, the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord. The brain, again, is within that cranial cavity. The spinal cord is within the vertebral cavity. And then all these other nerves that extend out are part of the peripheral nervous system. So there's everything else other than our brain and our spinal cord. Although, like I mentioned, those connections have to be made. So components of these kind of sneak into the cranial and vertebral cavities to connect everything. So I mentioned when we were reviewing those tissue types that the neuron is that classical example of a nerve cell um, or nervous tissue cell that we've uh, talked about before. These are really responsible for that communicative function, for sending electrochemical signals between different parts of the nervous system. Glial cells are support cells, so they um, structurally and functionally support neurons. Um, when you look at neurons, you can kind of see the cell body, the axon, the dendrites, making all those connections, sending signals. Glial cells look very, very different. So we'll kind of review those individually um, and talk about their structure and function. Before we do that, though, I did want to kind of um, start thinking kind of about the larger scale structures of the central nervous system um, as well as the peripheral nervous system. So you might have heard the terms gray matter and white matter, and that actually has to do with the arrangement of nerve cells or um, neurons in your body. So you can see here that the gray matter is actually kind of pink and the white matter is kind of yellow. Um, and that white matter appearance might get you thinking about the way that lipids look or adipose tissue. And the reason for that is that the white matter has to do with fat that is deposited around different parts of the neuron. So when we're looking at the structure of the neuron, we start by looking at that cell body, which is also called the soma, that contains the nucleus and other important organelles. So the liquidy stuff, the cytosol inside of that soma, um, is kind of what you would expect to find in other types of cells. Um, it's doing its own thing. It's like the actual cell body, um, but then it's going to change a little bit in terms of composition as we move away. So just keep that in mind. But we have the full cell body and the nucleus and, and different organelles within that soma. The process is kind of the extension, so that can be the axon or it can be the dendrites. Um, when you learn about the skeletal system, you might talk about the, a process on a bone. So when in biology and specifically in anatomy, when we're talking about processes, we're talking about extensions. Um, that gets kind of confusing. So anatomy has to do with structure. Physiology has to do with function. And so in anatomy, when we're talking about a process, it's an extension. It's something that pokes out. It's a structure. In physiology, when we're talking about a process, we're talking about like a mechanism or a series of events. Um, so that has to do with function. Biology is so confusing. I'm really sorry. There's just so much overlap in terms. But here, a process means something that sticks out. So that could be the axon or can be the dendrites. Um, those axons are big fibers that connect neurons to their targets. So you can see it extending outward here. The dendrites are these kind of sticky branching things that stick out from the soma, from the cell body, and receive input from other neurons. So the end of one neuron's axon connects to the dendrites on the cell body of another neuron. And you can kind of see that pictured at the top and at the bottom of this image. So like I mentioned, there's fat depositions around that axon and myelin is the name of that fatty substance that helps propagate electrochemical signals. 
Um, so I'll explain that when we talk about action potentials, but for now, just keep in mind that it kind of insulates the axon and leaves these gaps between those myelin sheaths, and those are called the nodes of Ronvier. So the cell body constitutes gray matter. When we have cell bodies packed together, that's what gives gray matter its appearance. When we have axons packed together with all that fat around them, that's what gives white matter its appearance. So we can see that here on this brain, um, the gray matter actually appears kind of pink or tan, um, and then the white matter looks quite white due to the lipid content of the myelin. So going back to this image, I'm going to expand on some details here, and we're going to zoom in on certain parts of it. So here we can see kind of those gaps that I mentioned between the myelin sheets and those, um, actually before we get into that, kind of go extending from where the cell body is to where it starts to taper into the axon. I mentioned that it, the internal environment kind of changes a little bit. Um, here we go from having cytoplasm inside of the main cell body to having what's called axoplasm. So it's just like cytoplasm for the axon. Um, and so this is called the initial segment or the axon hillock. I'm not going to test you on those terms. I just want to introduce them to you because a lot of you will go on to take anatomy and physio. And so you should be familiar with those terms when you teach or take those courses. Um, so that change in cytoplasm is going to be really important for action potentials because that material inside of the uh, axoplasm um, is important for kind of the ion changes and the charge changes that are going to take place. So we don't have any more organelles in there. Um, we don't have like proteins being made or anything. It's basically this special cytoplasm that has a bunch of ions at a very particular concentration. And then I mentioned those nodes of Ronvier, which are those gaps between those myelin sheaths. Um, and the electrochemical signal is going to kind of jump from one of those to the next um, in what's called saltatory conduction. So I'll review that in a little bit. Don't stress about you knowing that term yet. Just to kind of imagine the little signal jumping from one node to the next. And then kind of expanding back out and looking towards the ends of this, um, at the and we have the axon terminal. So going from the cell body to the axon is the initial segment. At the end of the axon, we have the terminal segment, the axon terminal. Um, and so that kind of distinction between initial and terminal is important because that's the direction in which the signal gets sent. So the signals go from the cell body to the axon terminal towards the synapses so they can go on to the next cell. They don't go back the other way. Um, so this is the end of the axon and it actually branches out quite a bit. Um, and at the end of those synapses, we have what are called synaptic end bulbs where these little projections called synapses kind of uh, widen a little bit, um, and that is able to kind of make a connection with the next cell, but not really. Um, the synapse uh, is kind of this opening that's really between those two. Um, so there's, they don't touch each other exactly. They leave space between one another and send uh, chemical signals out between them. So I'll show you pictures of those later so we can kind of help visualize that. Um, but on the cell body, we have those branching dendrites, um, that D-E-N-D-R kind of refers to trees. So whenever you see something in biology that starts with dendrite or dendrogram that starts with that dendr, um, it's going to have kind of a branching structure. Um, then the synapse with those synaptic end bulbs is going to be the end of the cell. So I mentioned that not all neurons look like those multipolar neurons that we're used to seeing. Um, some of them are unipolar, which means they only have one little thing branching out from them. Some of them are bipolar, like uh, in our um, nose and in our eyes. And so these have two poles, they're bipolar. And then multipolar means that there's one axon and two or more dendrites, so lots of poles, lots of projections coming off of that cell body.
Okay, so I talked about those glial cells and how they have their own structure and function that's quite different from those uh, neurons that we're used to seeing. So I'll talk about each one of those in turn. Another word for these are neuroglia. So that glia just tells you that they're support structures. Before we go on though, I did wanna acknowledge that there is a term you might see um, in anatomy and physio, ganglion. Um, and it has that glia in it, uh, but it actually um, doesn't refer to the support cells. It refers to a group of neurons. So that's a little bit trickly, tricky, um, but neuroglia or glial cells specifically refers to non-neuronal support cells. So in the central nervous system, we have astrocytes, which look like stars. That's why they're called astrocytes or star cells. Um, you can see them pictured in the bottom right. These are really important for regulating uh, nutrients and ions and neurotransmitters, so kind of controlling the chemical aspect of our brain um, and our nervous system. They also provide structural support for synapses, so those gaps between neurons, and they help form the blood-brain barrier. Um, so blood uh, doesn't go directly to your brain matter. Um, I mean, there's tons of arteries in your brain, but they kind of go through this um, filtration process. Um, and we have something called the blood brain barrier uh, that's, that some material can't cross. Um, so the astrocytes help make that blood brain barrier. We also have microglia, which help protect the nervous system from infection. Um, when we talked about the immune system, we talked about phagocytotic cells that can go through phagocytosis and eat other cells. Um, the microglia are an example of that in the nervous system. There's also oligodendrocytes, which produce myelin sheets on that central um, on neurons in the central nervous system. And these are different from how myelin sheets are formed in the peripheral nervous system. Um, so you can see that they, this image is kind of cool. It's like a little guy like standing on the neuron and looking so proud of himself. But um, that's the oligodendrocyte and it's um, that one cell is producing many different myelin sheets. Uh, in the peripheral nervous system, uh, each cell produces only one myelin sheet. So these myelin sheets, again, are important for propagating the electrochemical signal uh, by insulating the axon and kind of pushing that signal ahead. We also have ependymal cells, which are important for filtration. Um, they also make what's called cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, um, and so they have tight junctions, um, so they're able to kind of control material passing through. They're important for circulating um, that cerebrospinal fluid uh, because they have cilia, which you can see in this um, histological slide. Uh, there's also this cute little graphic of what they look like. Um, so remember, cilia are found on some cells um, and they kind of help move stuff along. So in our respiratory system, we have that ciliary escalator that pushes out foreign invaders, different particles and bacteria when we cough stuff out. Um, these ependymal cells are important for circulating around that cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so in the peripheral nervous system, we have a couple different types of support cells. We have satellite cells, which wrap around neurons in the uh, peripheral nervous system. Um, and they're kind of similar to astrocytes, but they don't form a blood-brain barrier. So they just kind of do that um, support role that astrocytes do with regulating uh, concentrations of different chemicals. So there's also the Schwann cells, and like I mentioned here in the peripheral nervous system, there's a one-to-one -one ratio of Schwann cell to myelin sheath. So um, in this top image, you can see uh, this is like a cross-section of an axon. Um, you can see the uh, myelin sheath wrapped directly around the axon, and then the Schwann cell is on top of that. So they wrap around the axon, and they form the myelin sheath between themselves and the axon. And again, that's important for propagating electrochemical signals. Okay, so I've talked a lot about action potentials, but I haven't properly explained what those are. Um, but first I wanna kind of briefly review some stuff um, about cell membranes. 
So remember, we have a phospholipid bilayer um, that has a bunch of fat in it, so it's very hydrophobic. And material that likes water, that's hydrophilic, can't cross through it easily. So we have a lot of different material that is embedded in the membrane, including channel proteins. Um, and so hydrophilic molecules, like ions, uh, which dissolve quite easily in water, often pass through those channel proteins in what's called facilitated diffusion. So this is a passive process, it doesn't require energy, um, but in some situations, those channel proteins aren't automatically open. So we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, you should also know about sodium potassium pumps. Um, those are um, also referred to by their kind of uh, abbreviations, that Na plus K plus ATPAs, because they're technically an enzyme. Um, they're enzymes that provide what's called active transport. So they move stuff, but it costs energy because they're moving stuff against concentration gradients. So these guys are really important for maintaining uh, what's called resting membrane potential. Um, so they kind of keep things the way they're supposed to be at a state of rest. Um, and that state is the membranes uh, or the interior environment beneath the membranes needs to be negative relative to their environment. So I'm gonna walk you through this process. Um, so at rest, uh, sodium concentration is higher outside the cell and potassium is higher inside. And uh, to keep it that way, material needs to be moved against a concentration gradient. Sodium needs to be pushed outside to keep it higher outside. Potassium needs to be moved inside to keep it higher inside. Um, so what's gonna happen is we're gonna have three sodium ions that just bound to that channel protein, to that um, to this really special active transport sodium potassium pump. Um, so they, they bound to that pump right there. Um, they, uh, there was also an ATP that got bound and split. Um, and so that ATP gets split, that P pops off. Um, the sodium gets pushed outside, sodium is released. The enzyme changes shape, which you're seeing take place here. Potassium is able to bind. Potassium is that K plus that just bound and it gets pushed inside. So we have sodium being built up outside and potassium being built up inside. And that's the way things are kind of supposed to be at a state of rest before we have a signal being sent. So a voltage-gated channel is a specific type of channel protein that only opens up when you reach a certain threshold. So at rest, your resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. Um, so that number is very important. So negative 70 is the state of rest. And at that state of rest, your voltage-gated channels that move sodium are closed. Um, and so once you get to a certain point, once you have a, a signal that's strong enough, um, so, uh, the channels are going to open and sodium is going to be able to move from the outside inward. So remember, sodium is higher outside. Once those channels open, it's going to rush inward. Um, and so that's going to make the cell more and more positive relative to the outside. And so that threshold is actually negative 55 millivolts. So if we get more positive than that, say negative 50, which is still negative, but more positive than negative 50, or sorry, than negative 55. Um, once we get to that threshold, once we pass negative 55, once we get to negative 50 or so, um, then the channel is going to open up and it's going to let stuff through. And remember, when you let stuff through, that stuff is going to have a positive charge. So it's going to keep that voltage getting higher and higher. And all along that axon, you're gonna have this opening up sequentially of those voltage-gated channels, um, and it's going to depolarize. So it's gonna go from being really negative to being really positive inside that environment. So here we see that depolarization is becoming more positive or less negative. Um, so when those voltage gated uh, sodium channels open, um, that sodium ion is gonna rush inside of the cell. It's gonna become more and more positive, but eventually it's going to stop. So then at that point, um, those channels are going to close. 
and you have what's called repolarization. So the cell is going to become more and more negative. Um, those potassium channels are now going to open. They are going to leave the cell and the inside of the cell is going to become more and more negative. And actually it hyperpolarizes at a certain point where it goes past its resting potential um, before everything kind of regulates back out and it's able to receive a signal again. So we can kind of visualize this here with sodium in purple and uh, potassium in yellow. Um, remember there's those different types of channels. There's the potassium channels on the far left, the um, sodium potassium pumps that require ATP in the center in blue, and then the sodium channels on the right. Um, and at rest, we have a resting potential of minus 70 millivolts, which we see at the top um, when we have that signal that depolarization, those sodium channels are going to open up at that threshold um, and sodium is going to rush into the cell. Um, and so that's going to continue to happen until you get to a stopping point at the peak of the action potential. Those sodium channels are now going to close and your potassium channels are going to open. Potassium is going to leave the cell and it's going to become more and more negative until you get back to resting potential. So when this happens, again, it's happening sequentially along the axon. So it's starting near the cell body um, at that initial segment and it's moving its way to the axon terminal. So here um, on the image on the left, you can see that cell body and axon. You can see that the initial segment is depolarized. It becomes more positive inside the cell. That area then repolarizes, but it's already changed um, that signal and it's caused the next set of sodium uh, channels to open up. So that next set is becoming depolarized. And so then that area is going to become repolarized and the next set of pumps or the next set of channels is going to open up um, and become depolarized. Now the original set is at resting, that middle set is repolarizing and the terminal set is depolarizing and that will go through the process of repolarizing and then being at rest again and we see this happening on this gif on the right um, this kind of sequential depolarization repolarization and back at rest So we can say that an action potential is this process where we have a change in the voltage of a cell membrane uh, in response to a stimulus that results in the transmission of an electrical or electrochemical signal. Um, so here we have um, kind of a summary combining those two images that we saw on the previous slide where you have that depolarization, repolarization, and going back to rest along the axon. If we measure this and uh, kind of think back to those numbers that we talked about previously, um, at rest it's minus 70 millivolts. Um, at the peak of the action potential, it's about positive 30 millivolts. Uh, but remember, it kind of spikes up once you get to past 50, minus 55 millivolts. When it repolarizes, it actually goes down and hyperpolarizes, so it goes down to about minus 90 millivolts past that minus 70, um, so it's hyperpolarized, and then it balances back out again. So the tricky thing here is that in that period when it's reacting, it can't react to something else. So we'll get back to that in just a moment. Um, so I'm going to continue looking at this, and we're going to look at a GIF. The GIF is going to be too quick for you to see at first, so I'm going to let it play through, and then I'll point out some stuff. Um, so this GIF is tracking those millivolts, and um, you can see that right there, when it shoots up to the top of the action potential, that signal is being sent out, and this uh, neuron is illuminating. So we're going to see it again once it goes up from resting to action potential peak. Um, we saw that kind of flash, and so the signal was being sent out. Then it went back to hyperpolarized, um, so then uh, it dipped down really low, and then it levels back out again to the resting potential. So flash, and then back to being at rest until another signal is sent. So with that data, we can put together a curve that we usually see when we talk about action potentials. 
Um, so here we see at rest, um, the resting membrane potential is minus 70. Past that threshold of minus 55, it shoots up and it's depolarized. At the peak of the action potential, it's 30 millivolts, um, positive 30. It then uh, we have those channels kind of closing. We have repolarization. Um, it goes down to hyperpolarization, so past resting potential, and then evens back out as those sodium potassium pumps get back to doing their normal thing. So here, when we have um, the signal being sent, like I mentioned, that action potential and then the hyperpolarization going back to uh, getting back to the resting membrane potential, um, we have to have those ions kind of restabilizing. So they have to get back to their normal state. And if they're not there yet, a new signal can't be sent. So we have what are called refractory periods where you can't really do anything else until things get back to the way they were before. So earlier, I talked a lot about those myelin sheets and saltatory conduction I briefly mentioned. Um, there are some axons that don't have myelin sheets, um, and so that's when we have continuous conduction, where the signal is sent, but it doesn't skip ahead. Um, when we have myelination and we have things like wrapped up the way they're supposed to be, um, that uh, provides insulation, um, and so the electrochemical signal is going to jump between those nodes of Ranvier, and it's going to be sent more quickly. I'm not sure if any of you have seen the movie Lorenzo's Oil. I watched it in high school biology, um, but it was about a boy with, um, I think, ALS who had deterioration of his myelin sheets, so he could send signals um, down his neurons, uh, but they would never reach where they were supposed to because he didn't have myelination. And so his parents were trying to find a diet for him um, to rebuild the myelinated sheets. He did eventually pass away, but it was like really a moving story and I'd recommend looking into it for kind of a human impact of this. So when you do have that signal sent down to the axon terminal and it reaches the synapse, it is then able to open another set of voltage-gated channels, which are voltage-gated calcium channels. And so when that calcium floods into the axoplasm at this end near the synaptic bulbs, it causes all these vesicles or little packages of neurotransmitters to move towards the end of that cleft or that bulb. They open up and they spread across that gap, across the synapse. Um, and so then they're able to bind to receptors on the next cell and cause another response. And a lot of um, different medications, um, illicit or prescribed, uh, have an effect on these receptors. So they might block receptors, they might kind of change reuptake of these molecules um, and have different neurological effects. So those neurotransmitters, like I mentioned, travel across the synapse, bind to specific receptors that are present. If those receptors are blocked, they just kind of float around um, and they're not able to be used or recycled. So before I go on, I just want to acknowledge action potentials are super tricky. They're like very hard to understand. Um, it's an example of kind of like electrochemistry in biology. Um, you're trying to think about all the different numbers and peaks. Um, go easy on yourself. I'm not going to have you like draw out action potentials or ask you super detailed questions about them. Um, it took me years to understand them. So watch the crash course video, listen to this lecture a few times, give yourself space to be like, yeah, this is really confusing. I'm going to keep working at it until I understand it a little bit more. Um, and a big part of being a scientist is recognizing when you don't understand something because scientists specialize. They don't know everything about everything, and it's okay for you not to super understand action potentials. Just want to say that moving forward. Okay, so kind of getting back to the central versus the peripheral nervous system. Um, I mentioned that the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord, but I just wanted to anatomically kind of cover those really fast. So in the brain, we have the meninges. Um, and so the meninges kind of surround the brain um, and protect it. Um, those uh, meninges, if you've 
think about meningitis, like I mentioned, that's swelling of the meninges. So these are the layers of tissue around the central nervous system. Um, and so we say that the nervous system is privileged because it can receive antigens. Remember, antigens are non-self signals um, that kind of trigger an immune response. And they can, the nervous system can receive these antigens and not get inflamed and not swell up. Because if it swells up, that's you know really bad for it. It has its own set of phagocytes, it does its own thing. We say that it's immune privileged. Um, and so when blood is supplied to the brain, it's filtered through the cerebrospinal fluid that floats between different layers of the meninges. So uh, we have our skull, which is made of bone. Um, and then below that, we have the dura mater, which is really thick and fibrous. It's anchored into that bone. Below that, we have the arachnoid mater, which is more thin and loose. Um, and then below the arachnoid matter, we have the cerebrospinal fluid in the subarachnoid space. So subarachnoid means below arachnoid. It's a layer beneath the second layer. Um, and it's actually a gap. Um, and that's where that CSF is circulating around. And then below that, we have the pia mater, um, which follows all the different curves of the brain. So we have these different layers of tissue that protect the brain and circulate that cerebrospinal fluid. That's really the extent of what you need to know about the meninges. So then um, our, our central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord. Um, I'm not gonna go into brain anatomy. That's something that you'll cover a lot when you take anatomy and physiology. Um, just keep in mind there's kind of different regions of the brain. Um, the brain stem is that bottom kind of central part of it. Um, we have what's called the corpus callosum, which connects the right and left hemispheres of the brain. Um, the cerebral cortex is the layer that covers the entire surface of the brain. Um, there's a couple of other things I want to point out. Um, so the brain is divided into lobes. Knowing these terms will be really important for uh, when you go on to anatomy. So just knowing where like frontal and occipital are. So I'll review that in just a moment. Um, and then when you learn the different bones of the skull and the brain case uh, next week in lab, it will be good to know these terms as well. So frontal lobe is that front kind of by your forehead. The parietal lobe is the next one moving backwards, so moving more posteriorly, but not quite at the back of your head. So kind of transitioning from the front to the back and top of your head. Then we have the occipital lobe, which is at the back of your head. And then um, where your temples are, the temporal lobe, you have that on either side. So you should know frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal, and the rough position of those. You should also be aware of the limbic system. Um, so this consists of the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the amygdala, and the hippocampus. Remember last week when we talked about the endocrine system, we talked about the endocrine functions of the hypothalamus and the anterior and posterior pituitary. I just briefly mentioned those. We didn't go super into depth on those, um, but they are part of the endocrine system. They're also part of the limbic system, which is a unique set of structures in your brain that are important for regulating emotions, key behaviors um, that are associated with emotions and memory. So if you hear the limbic system, this is what this is referring to. So moving down um, away from our brain, we have the spinal cord. Um, and so that's a bundle of nerve tissue that sends signals between the brain and the body. So it connects that central processing of the brain to the actual function of the body. And remember, it's protected by the vertebral column. Um, we can actually see arrangements of gray matter and white matter. Um, so this kind of butterfly looking thing in the center is uh, the, um, the horns um, that uh, so they have like different structure or like different areas. Um, they're called the gray horns um, and there's the white matter um, kind of around it. So we have the butterfly structure which is the cell bodies and then everything around it is the, um, the axons with the myelin sheaths wrapped around it. So you can see that arrangement here. And different parts of your spine have um, kind of different numbers and letters associated with them. The C's at the top stand for cervical, which means neck. 
The T stands for thoracic, which means chest. The L stands for uh, uh, lumbar, which means lower back, like lumbar support. And then the S stands for sacral and coccyx. Um, so you're like very far lower back towards your tailbone. Um, so we have different spinal nerves that extend out from uh, each of these different positions. Um, and when you have a spinal cord injury, that often leads to paralysis of different degrees. So in the U.S. every year, there's about 10,000 spinal cord injuries. Um, and depending on how badly you sever or damage your uh, spinal cord or the different spinal nerves and where it cuts off, you might have different degrees of paralysis. So for example, if you uh, sever the spinal cord around um, uh, like your lumbar region, you might still have function of your arms, but you're not necessarily able to move your legs. If you sever the spinal cord around the cervical region, then you might not have function of your arms or your legs. Um, so that's how we have kind of different degrees of paralysis depending on where the spinal cord is injured. And actually I saw a really cool story recently where um, when we did the skeletal lecture, I talked about uh, human exoskeletons and how you could use like machinery to help reinforce or provide extra strength. Um, and this guy is actually able to send signals from his brain to this exoskeleton that he wears um, outside of his body that has allowed him to move his hands and walk again. Um, so obviously that's in like very early stages of development. It's Still, like prohibitively expensive and he was just part of this experiment um, but there's a lot of hope for people who really uh, you know are going through serious things and want that degree of movement and autonomy again um, so it's something that's becoming more of a possibility all right so getting into the peripheral nervous system and away from the central nervous system um, I'm going to focus first on the autonomic nervous system, which remember is involuntary. It's stuff that we don't necessarily control, like um, our breathing or like our digestive system. Um, so when we have homeostasis, it's basically a balance between reactions that are more sympathetic and reactions that are parasympathetic. And another word for sympathetic is fight or flight. Um, like in this example, there's like a little weird snake chasing this guy. Um, so when like you get cut off in traffic and you have a specific set of um, like reactions within your body that you can't really control to that stimulus, that's a fight or flight response. Um, something that's also really important to remember is it's actually fight or flight or freeze. Um, a lot of people uh, who have been through traumatic situations um, get uh, doubted because they freeze in those situations and are not able to do anything about it. Um, but sometimes you go into that reaction where you don't have a voluntary control over your body um, and freezing is part of that. So please keep that in mind biologically. Um, and then there's also rest or digest where like after you eat a really big meal, um, your body responds in a certain way and that's parasympathetic. And so homeostasis is kind of going between these two sets of autonomic responses. Um, and so some of these uh, reactions might be kind of familiar to you. With rest and digest, um, this is when your like pupils constrict, you have a slower heartbeat, your airways are kind of constricted, your stomach is really active, um, glucose is not being released from your liver because you have plenty of it inside of your bloodstream, so it's getting stored as glycogen inside of your liver. Um, it also stimulates sexual arousal, so this is also called feed and breed. Um, so basically, you're safe. You can take care of base body functions like eating and breeding, um, and so that's rest and digest. That's parasymp controlled by parasympathetic nerves. Um, the reactions controlled by sympathetic nerves are where the signal is being sent along those nerves. That's fight or flight, so your pupils get dilated, um, you have really increased heartbeat, uh, your airways relax, your stomach activity is inhibited, so you can't really eat. Um, you have blood increased blood sugar because glycogen is being broken down in your liver to release glucose, your adrenaline is being released. Um, there's also some sexual reactions associated with that. Um, so again, like when you get cut off in traffic or when you have to make a speech in front of a bunch of people, these are all reactions you might be familiar with. And actually saliva uh, is involved in both of these as well. For parasympathetic, you have saliva being released, but for sympathetic, um, like when you have to make a speech and your mouth gets really dry, that is another 
uh, sympathetic response. There's also structural differences between the nerves that send signals for the parasympathetic reactions and the sympathetic reactions. Um, you will have to know these for anatomy, but I'm not gonna test you on them. I just want you to be familiar with this idea that the structure of these nerves, their organization, where they emerge, how they connect with their target organs, um, and the neurotransmitters they release are different. Okay, so that was unconscious control or involuntary responses. Now we'll think about how we sense the world around us and have voluntary responses. So this is called the sensory somatic nervous system. Um, that includes cranial nerves, which emerge from or enter into our skull. There are 12 main cranial nerves, um, and you usually have to like know them for upper division classes, um, when, maybe once you enter the nursing program. I don't have my anatomy and physio students memorize them, but some nursing students do have to, um, and they are associated with things like vision and taste, so some of those key senses. Um, and there's also the spinal nerves, which emerge from the vertebral column. So here you can see that gray matter and white matter like we looked at before on the spinal cord. And then we see these spinal nerves um, that are labeled on the right side emerging from that spinal column or spinal cord. So there's a test that you can do in a clinical setting called a neurological exam. Um, it starts out just by like interviewing a patient to make sure that their responses are quick and accurate. Um, so like asking them questions about their name and age and birthplace, stuff like that. And then you can also do different things like having them uh, like shining a light on their pupils, but then also having them uh, sniff something or look at something and describe it or um, taste something or do different reflexes or different movements to see how they well they control it. Um, so that's the neurological exam. And there's a lot of different takes on it, but it's good for starting to pinpoint different uh, neurological problems. So to kind of discuss some of those neurological problems that might be identified or um, at least indicated by the neurological exam. Um, so there's a type of disorders or diseases called neurodegenerative, which means a loss of function. So degeneration implies that um, it was at a healthy state and is now being broken down and might get worse over time. One example of this is Alzheimer's disease, um, which is a very common cause of dementia. Then there's also Parkinson's disease, which has a um, distinct kind of set of symptoms that involve a lot of tremors and shaking um, and loss of function. So those are two that you might be familiar with already. Those are examples of neurodegenerative diseases. There's also neurodevelopmental disorders which occur really early in development, so um, maybe as a fetus or in early childhood, maybe during birth um, or kind of in your youth, and so it affects the development of your nervous system before it's already developed. So these might include things like autism spectrum disorder, which we are starting to be able to diagnose more efficiently, but we still don't understand super well. Um, People who have autism spectrum disorder have a lot of different ways that they like to define that or label it. Um, so it's always best to kind of uh, best practice to ask the patient kind of how they might classify it because it is a spectrum and we're still not really understanding it fully. For some cases of autism spectrum disorder, there is a genetic basis and or a neuronal basis kind of in terms of how different neurons connect together or the types of neurons that are present. But again, it's currently poorly understood. Um, it is important to note that um, certain other conditions are uh, occur in higher rates in people with autism spectrum disorder. But uh, something that I really, really want to emphasize is that vaccines do not cause autism. So um, there's a lot of people who still have concerns about vaccines. It's a conversation you'll probably have to have with a lot of your patients if you go into nursing. Um, but the paper that came out that said that there was a correlation between vaccines and incidence of autism autism uh, was disproven. It was found that the guy was being paid off by different companies. Um, he lost his medical license. It was a um, just completely false paper, um, but it's kind of stuck in the public perception. Part of the problem is that um, 
when because of like the rate at which people are given vaccines or the rate at which children are given vaccines um, we start to give them and people have immune systems that are primed for vaccines around the time they start engaging in behaviors where we can actually identify autism because you can't really identify autism spectrum disorders in a newborn who hasn't even received vaccines. So part of it is just the timing of medical procedures. Um, there's a part of it is like now vaccines are more common and we're also getting better at diagnosing autism. So it's just kind of like a coincidental increase in rates of both of them, um, but there's not a causal link. Um, and I'm happy to share more information. I think I did upload a uh, vaccine kind of fact sheet a few weeks ago. So if you have questions about vaccines, please email me or look over those misconceptions. Um, but there is not a relationship between vaccines and autism. Okay, um, so another neurodevelopmental disorder is cerebral palsy, which doesn't have one particular cause, um, but it's a group of motor disorders that emerge in early childhood um, that can happen uh, or have causative agents kind of before birth or after birth um, due to abnormal brain development. Um, and then mental health conditions also might be classified as neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, it's a little bit tricky because there is a neurobiological and neurochemical basis here. But our brains are very plastic and actually a lot of, um, of therapy has to do with kind of rewiring and retraining connections in the brain. So this idea of neuroplasticity, um, we are heavily influenced by the effects of our environment, uh, particularly in regards to trauma. Um, and uh, for a long time, there's been a disconnect between our understanding of trauma and our kind of biological and neurobiological approach to uh, treating patients, um, maybe psychiatrically, uh, but recently there's been kind of more of an awareness that like, yes, PTSD is real. Yes, people who are raised in neighborhoods that experience a lot of um, socio-economical uh, um, kind of oppression and co constant violence ha are exposed to trauma and have physiological effects because of that. Um, so we're kind of changing our understanding of these, but different things like depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, which is very serious and debilitating and not just like, oh, I lined up all my groceries, I have OCD, so be careful about how you talk about that because you'll have patients who have it. Um, things like bipolar disorder, those have neurobiological and neurochemical bases that we're starting to understand more, um, but are still very different from patient to patient, and there's a lot of different treatment regimens for all of those. Um, other neurological disorders include epilepsy, which is classified by recurrent seizures, maybe due to a brain injury, disease, or other illnesses. Um, so I included some information about that. Um, it can be treated with medication. It's very common, uh, but it's still really tricky and needs to be maintained. Um, and you need to have adherence and compliance um, with your treatment protocol. If someone is having a seizure, um, I want because all of you or most of you are interested in um, health professions. So if someone's having a seizure, stay with them, keep them safe, turn them on their side if they start convulsing um, so they don't aspirate. Um, and then if the seizure lasts longer than five minutes, call 911. Um, if another seizure starts or the per person really needs assistance, call 911. Um, but a lot of people kind of have this misconception that you need to like hold someone still or restrain them. Don't do that. Don't put anything in their mouth. Um, I think that's to avoid like having them bite themselves, but uh, it's better just to like, you know, let them do what they need to do and go through the seizure so you don't risk any neck injuries or aspiration or anything like that. There's also strokes. Um, so that happens when you have a loss of blood flow to part of the brain. Um, and then the effects of this last at least 24 hours to be classified as a stroke. Um, it can be ischemic, which is where your blood vessels are blocked or narrowed or hemorrhagic, where you actually have damage to the blood vessel that results in bleeding into the brain. Um, you can spot a stroke using the Be Fast protocol. So is the person balanced? Um, are they having double vision? Are they able to see through their eyes? 
um, for their face is one side of it drooping you can ask them to smile to identify that more clearly have them lift their arms out and see if they're able to keep their arms steady um, check them basic questions or have them repeat basic phrases to check their speech um, and then act quickly so time is the last part of that Okay, so getting into how we sense and perceive the world around us, um, we'll start by talking about sensory processes, so distinguishing between sensation and perception and knowing the steps to have an actual perception. Um, go into somatosensation, so identify five types of receptors, and then for taste, smell, hearing, balance, and vision, you should know the scientific name for each of these and at least one obvious structure. So I used my slides from anatomy here just in case you want to read more about each of these and just to make sure you're prepared, um, but I will verbally tell you which structures are good to know for these. Okay, so when we say sensation, we mean that some sensory receptor cells on our body, like on our skin or on our eyes, are being activated by a stimulus. So something is binding to a receptor or pressing on a cell membrane, we're sensing something. So a stimulus is sending a signal from those sensory cells to the central nervous system. When we have integration that in our brain, that's called perception. So your brain is able to process that stimulus um, into some meaningful pattern and you perceive it. And then when you perceive it, you might have a voluntary motor response um, or kind of a reaction or reflex to it. So again, um, when you have a stimulus that often physically changes a receptor, sometimes it just causes kind of like pressing on the plasma membrane, or it might actually be a ligand binding to a receptor. So for example, in taste, a molecule in your food binds to a taste receptor that causes ion channels to open and you have a response or reaction. So this might generate an action potential. So in order for a sensation to occur, for you to actually perceive it, you have to have a few different prerequisites that are fulfilled. So you have to have a stimulus present. It can't just come from nothing. Um, you have to have reception. You have to have the receptor for it or you know, a specific type of receptor present to convert it into a nerve impulse. That signal has to be transduced. So you have to have transduction. It, the impulse is sent to the brain. Um, and then you have to have perception where the brain actually integrates it and translates it into something meaningful that you perceive as a sensation. So when we're talking specifically about somatosensation, that's sensations that are received from the skin and mucous membranes, um, as well as the limbs and the joints. So this is more touch. Um, this is like tactile sense or touch. And when we're thinking about receptors that are kind of um, involved with touch and with other sensations, there are mechano, uh, mechanoreceptors. Um, again, like I mentioned, kind of plasma membrane distortion can send a signal. So here are these mechanoreceptors sense stimuli due to physical deformation of that plasma membrane, so touch or pressure. Um, in terms of temperature, those are thermal receptors. Um, so these are activated by kind of cold and hot temperatures, and they send that information along pathways that are similar to pain pathways or nociception. Um, so when something's extremely hot or extremely cold, um, it's kind of good to react to that similarly to pain because those can actually cause tissue damage. There's also proprioception or um, proprioceptors. So this is awareness of your body position, which is processed in the cerebellum, a unique part of the brain um, that coordinates muscle contraction. There's nociception or pain receptors. Um, so this is in response to real or perceived tissue damage. Um, so real, like, you know, your tissue is actually damaged or perceived like you just ate a really hot chili pepper and that capsaicin is think making you think that you are, you know, burning up from the inside and in a lot of pain. Um, and so that's why we kind of react to hot foods in that way sometimes. And then chemoreceptors are really important for responding to chemical stimuli. Um, these uh, perceive like changes in, um, in uh, carbon dioxide levels when we're breathing. So they can kind of sense carbon dioxide levels as uh, carbonic acid and bicarbonate in our bloodstream. So we know how to regulate our breathing by sending that signal to our brain.
So there's a couple different types of senses or categories of senses. Um, there's general senses where all the receptors are distributed throughout the body. So this is something like touch or movement where it's kind of a general sense. You have those receptor cells present within um, structures on many different organs, whereas special senses have one specific organ devoted to them. So when we talk about special senses, this is something like vision, which you accomplish with your eyes, or um, hearing, which you accomplish with your inner ear, taste, which you accomplish with your tongue, and smelling, which you accomplish with your nose. Um, so these are considered special senses. So we talked briefly about touch as a general sense. Now we'll focus on the special senses. So these um, different sense systems help us interpret and perceive information from the world around us. Okay, so when we say taste, that is the common term for goose, gustation. So you should know that gustation refers to taste and you should know that we accomplish this using our tongue, which has taste buds and receptor cells. For smell, the technical term for that is olfaction. You should know that olfaction means smell and that we accomplish that using special cells in our nose. So olfactory epithelium within our nasal cavity and special sensory neurons, but really it comes down to olfaction happening in your nose. Audition means hearing. Um, so structures involved with this are all different parts of your ear, um, those special ossicles or bones, the malleus, incus, and stapes, which are those really tiny bones, things like the tympanic membrane or the eardrum, um, canals, cochlea, hair cells, but really it comes down to your hair, to your, sorry, to your ear, you hear with your ear, so audition happens in your ears. Um, something that's kind of cool about this, though, is that the sound waves that make their way into those internal structures don't have to actually come through your ears. Um, so you can uh, go to different science museums and they have metal bars that you bite down on and it sends those uh, waves of information through your teeth and they eventually reach your inner ears and cause you to hear sounds. So it's completely silent. You can't hear it from the outside, but when you bite down on it and the waves get sent inward, you can actually hear it inside of your head, which is super crazy. So then equilibrium um, means balance. This is a vestibular sense. So this is our idea of balance and that's accomplished using our inner ear. And then vision is vision and this is accomplished using your eyes, special cranial nerves, um, your optic nerve. Um, and so it's a very complex process, but you should know that vision involves your eyes. Okay, so um, that's it. I realize I don't have an ending slide for this. Um, and that top right 36.5 is from anatomy, so sorry about including that here. Um, but yeah, I don't over uh, complicate these. I know there's a lot of information here, but please pay attention to what I told you to pay attention to. Don't make it more complex than you need to. Um, make sure you get the reflection done next week and that you get your um, your quiz done by Wednesday at midnight. Um, email me if you have any questions at all. I hope lab went super well today. Um, and that's it.